So before we bring up our next guest, I want to take a little trip down memory lane with him. Iranian students holding some 60 American embassy employees hostage at the embassy compound in Tehran today warned that they would kill their captives if the United States tried to intervene with force. With at least tacit support from Ayatollah Khomeini, the student siege of the American embassy brought the conflict between Iran's religious and political authorities to a head. The students say, however, that they have uncovered new documents which prove that all 50 of their hostages were engaged in espionage. They say there will be no trials based on this evidence if their demands are met. If the Shah is returned, they say the hostages will be free to go. Doug Tunnell, CBS News, Tehran. Please welcome the founder of Brick House uh, Vineyards, Doug Tunnell. I guess, you know, you spent 18 years as a correspondent for CBS in some of the hottest zones of the world, Beirut, Chad, you've covered the drug wars in Mexico. Um, what is the transition? How has the transition happened between being, you know, the A-list, I mean, a guy who worked with Walter Cronkite and Dan Rather, to having a very lovely vineyard <laughs> in the Willamette Valley. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I, I look back at the, that old video, and I, to me, the transition is absolutely clear and necessary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I uh, feel strangely at home here in Baghdad, and uh, although it seems a, a little, <laughs> seems a little friendlier than I remember it. Uh, <laughs> You know, I have a friend uh, named Larry who is still producing uh, for CBS News and is, as we speak tonight, um, in Afghanistan in Kabul, running the bureau for CBS there. And he is, Larry's 64 years old, he's a couple years older than me. And he was a Marine co uh, uh, captain in Vietnam and, and then he went into the news business and he has spent his entire life uh, in war zones. And I worked with him in Beirut, I worked with him in Tehran, I worked with him in Baghdad, and uh, you know, all of the garden spots. And um, he's, he's still at it. And I, I think you reach a point where you just say, you know, well, there's like two, there are two paths. <laughs> and one is going to lead you back to your home and a peaceful life, and the other is you're gonna keep doing what Larry's doing. And I'm just not that tough. Mm -hmm. I just can't. My, my cup of tolerance for um, violence and insurrection uh, is full. And at some point you come to terms with that and, you know, after all, I was born in Oregon. What, what the heck am I doing living anywhere else? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, it was a real moment in, in which you m made this transition, or at least laid the groundwork in terms of actually buying this old farm, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean. It, it, it was a it was a gradual transition. It took a number mm -hmm. of years. I was still working at CBS when I did find and buy the farm, uh, but by that time I was really into wine. I loved wine um, and very interested in it. And and then uh, in the early years, I uh, when I was still working at CBS, I'd take vacations and come back here and um, found great peace in just driving my John Deere 1070 and working the land, working mm -hmm. the soil. It just was very therapeutic. And uh, I think it's still kind of therapy, but now I do it uh, 365 days a year. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, what was your entree into wine? Um, I mean, mostly drinking it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, really thinking about, like, taking it apart and thinking, I want to make this. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, um, I, living in Europe, I lived in Europe for a number of years, living in Lebanon even, a great wine uh, business there, great wine country and, and culinary scene. Um, and so, you know, I, I just got very interested and really didn't set out to make wine. Uh, I thought that I, I didn't know how to do that. Uh, and I, I was ready to let other people that did know how to do that help me, and they did. But I, I then came to the conclusion that just growing grapes and trying to write great works and think great thoughts was not going to pay the rent, and I better make some wine. So you buckle down and uh, do what you have to do. And, uh, thanks to a lot of friends and, and really experienced winemakers, I was fortunate to learn enough to be able to start producing products, and, and we're still trying to make them better every year today. Hmm. Now, uh, uh, when you bought the farm, 
brick house, as you've, uh, as you've dubbed it. I mean, uh, 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 did, you, did you buy it with the idea that you were going to uh, grow grapes there, or was it originally yeah. the idea of uh, buying it? It was all about grapes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was the spot. And it, it met all the criteria that I, which were very rough at the time that I mm -hmm. understood that, that I should be looking for. And so it wasn't just the house. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> which is an incredible house. If you all haven't been there, you should make an, uh, 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 you know, try to go there. It's a beautiful place. Yeah, thanks. It's, uh, uh, it's really an unusual house. I, mm -hmm. for, for Oregon, you know, a brick house out in the middle of the country, I really don't know of any others around. Uh, it has quite an interesting around. story, too. I mean, it has a relationship to Portland in, in terms of yeah, its construction. Yeah, the man that built it uh, was, was actually worked on the, uh, the creation of the Portland docks with the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, his job was a very high-stress job, loading ships, uh, doing the ballast before the days of computers. This was back in the early or mid 20s. Um, and he then, uh, his granddaughter told us later, decided it was too much stress and wanted to get back out to farming and came out. And he had 120 acres and built this brick house. Also pretty early on, you made the decision to go even further in terms of biodynamic uh, uh, winemaking. Um, did that begin, I mean, this is Rudolf Steiner, the father of, uh, of, of biodynamic farming. Can you talk a little bit about that decision? Sure. You know, it uh, wasn't something that happened overnight. And in fact, I remember a friend here in Portland asking me, you know, would you ever consider biodynamics? And I said categorically, no, I've got enough work. You know, I, it's a whole other layer of work. Um, but in fact, uh, eventually I started uh, studying it. And, and as the years went on, the notion um, growing organically, uh, that in fact, I was running an operation and growing organically in which I really wasn't uh, feeding back uh, into the soil, into the vineyard, all the nutrient that I was taking out, not by a long shot. And I really wanted to find a way to do that. I needed a program to do that because otherwise, you know, it dawns on you, dawns on me after a number of years, probably too long, hey, I'm just mining this vineyard. I'm just taking out every year tons and tons of grapes, which means tons and tons of nutrient, and I'm not restoring, you know, and that's, that's not sustainable. Biodynamics seemed to offer a way uh, to do that in a, in a very systematic way, uh, and it's largely based on compost. Uh, the, the real importance of, of cow manure, cow dung, and, and building compost piles and then spreading that back out, taking all the stuff, the remnants, the detritus that's left after making wine and, and adding it with straw and manure and putting it back into the same vineyard where all of it came from in the first place. So it's working with this, the cycle of growth uh, and of decay, and of growth and of decay. And kind of like the mud moment, you know, mm -hmm. I was thinking about that uh, with Brahma, that, uh, you know, it's, it's that, it's, it's just when you, you think you're, you're decaying to the point you have no new idea or no idea of where to go that the inspiration strikes and, and then you begin to grow again. And nature's the same way. So now, are you using, a, 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 what kinds of things are you doing that are based on the calendar in terms of moon or stars or anything like that? We, you know, we have a calendar and both my vineyard manager and I read that calendar almost daily. And, and if we can, for example, uh, the calendar breaks the year up into four kinds of, of days for, for plants, uh, fruit days, root days, leaf days, and uh, flower days. And uh, there is, for example, uh, on the 13th and 14th of October, just coming up, uh, are two uh, very good fruit days. Uh, if we can pick our grapes <laughs> on the 13th and the 14th of October, we will make a special effort too. But if it's pouring down rain like it was today, we will not do it. <laughs> we have to be practical. This has to work for us. Um, and, and you may ask, well, why, why would you even bother? Uh, you know, it, it's a it's a very subtle thing. Um, I believe that in previous years, when we've picked on fruit days, uh, the fruit has in fact been more, more tasty, and the wines as a result have been a, a, a bit more complex, and had a, a, sort of an extra layer, an extra verve that uh, we don't get when we pick on other days. But I can't prove that. Uh, it's just an intuition, if you will. Um, going back to the salmon, I, I always think, you know, about, and cow horns and the rest, uh, you know, it's well known now that, that salmon uh, migrate up the, the streams where they were born a, a, as a result of an olfactory ability to sense where those home streams were. 
but uh, it, years and for many generations, perhaps millennia, the Native Americans were putting the bones of the salmon that they would eat back into the streams in order to signal to the salmon, they believe, where the salmon should come back to. Well, uh, they didn't understand olfactory functions of fish in those days, but it didn't stop them from putting the bones back in the river. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing largely with the biodynamic process. <laughs> we may not understand exactly what it is that happens with uh, the cow horn and the manure and the compost, uh, but there are very, very interesting things that happen, and uh, maybe one day we'll begin to understand them better. <laughs> so Wendell Berry was very important to you as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, He's, he, uh, he, I think he kind of says it all in, in many of the things that he has written, uh, both his, his prose and his poetry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, uh, Michael Pollan, you know, who I'm sure many of us here are familiar with, has said that, Wendell Berry was uh, instrumental in almost everything that he's written as a, as a guide. But if you look carefully, too, at Wendell Berry, Wendell Berry says there was another guy that really influenced everything that he's written, and that's a, a British fellow by the name of Sir Albert Howard, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, who was considered to be the founder of the organic movement in Britain, but really an interesting fellow because he was a scientist. He was a mycologist who studied mushrooms, and mushrooms uh, and the life of the soil, uh, the microorganisms of the soil. Uh, and as a result of, of all of that work, he really laid out um, principles that in the early years were considered organic, but if you read them today, they, they really define biodynamic agriculture to a T. And in fact, if I can find my glasses, can I read that? Sure. It's a quote from Sir Albert Howard. Yeah. yeah. Mother Earth never attempts to farm without livestock. She always raises mixed crops. Great pains are taken to preserve the soil and to prevent erosion. The mixed vegetable and animal wastes are converted into humus. There is no waste. The processes of growth and the processes of decay balance one another. Ample provision is made to maintain large reserves of fertility. The greatest care is taken to store rainfall. Both plants and animals are left to protect themselves against disease. And at the heart of it, that pretty well defines everything that Steiner taught just a few decades before. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, to my mind, puts it in some more clear and succinct language that has some real scientific legs to it. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, part of Barry's um, uh, writings is really about the structure of the farm, the economy of the farm, and he's a great advocate of, 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 of small farms and, and sort of distributed farming, which very much um, is, is kind of what the Willamette Valley has become in many ways, or yeah. maybe has been preserved. And I'm wondering, against you know, Barry's um, uh, thinking and your own thinking about uh, uh, farming since you've uh, come back to the valley, how do you think we're doing as a state? How do you think we're doing as, as, a, as a valley? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's the best of times and the worst of times. And I, uh, well, we'll start with the worst, I'm afraid, but I, right down the hill from us, as my wife reminded me this evening, um, you know, our, our nursery operations and other farms that are just uh, continuing in the old ways of uh, heavily uh, spraying chemicals of all sorts uh, for insecticides and fungal uh, disease problems and, and the like. A and that uh, right on the, in the watershed, uh, literally on the creeks below our farm, uh, going into those creeks I mentioned before and eventually the Willamette River, uh, which, you know, has, uh, I mean, the, the source of non-point agricultural pollution in the Willamette is really, it is the largest and most destructive source of pollution in the river, in the watershed. Uh, it's not the paper mills. It's, it's that stuff that seeps out of farmland all the way up the valley. Um, that continues. The bright side is that um, as many of you may have read, I mean, there are the, the number of young farmers, according to the agricultural census, is growing, and in the Willamette Valley, we're seeing that in spades, and and we we hear names of farms that are being run by by young farming couples in their 20s and 30s, uh, that uh, Big Table Farm, uh, Afton Fields Farm, um, there are farms on Grand Island in the Willamette, there are farms in Canby, there are farms in Eugene and in Philomath, 
and these are, these are back to the land, devoted young farmers that are following all the principles that Howard lays out here uh, with livestock and, and with organic growing. And it's really, it's very inspirational, at least uh, I, I think so, because it's the future. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing that happen too. Um, I think also we're, we've seen with the wine industry or my own industry that, that indeed people in the wine industry are really uh, taking this very seriously and finding all kinds of ways to reduce uh, their chemical use and their, their imprint on the land and on the watershed and on the environment generally. Well, I'm sure those young farmers find an inspiration in you and in having uh, uh, led at least part of the way. So um, we thank you for that. We'll have Doug back up for some questions in a few minutes. Um, thanks very thanks much. Thanks so much.